co-host, Dr. Rachel Palier, and our rapporteur, Dr. Romel Solabo. I will be introducing them a little bit more later on. But before I present the first speaker, I would like to remind our viewers of the following. Here are some guidelines for the Q&A portion. Type your questions in the Q&A chat toolbox. Refrain from asking similar questions. Upvote your questions you wish to be answered by hitting the like button in the Zoom and Q&A chat box. And if you wish to take a live, to ask a live question, just click raise hand and wait for the moderator to entertain you. Today, I am greatly honored and privileged to host this session as we have an excellent lineup of um, speakers who are multi-awarded scientists and trailblazers in their field of expertise. Our first invited lecturer is Dr. Jane Leach, a university distinguished professor and associate dean for research, College of Agriculture at the Colorado State University, USA. Dr. Leach is a plant pathologist. She is the current president of the International Society of Plant Pathology. She is a fellow and past president of the American Phytopathological Society or APS. Dr. Leach served on the APS public policy board for 16 years leading advocacy efforts such as Phytobiomes Initiative, a systems level approach to improving crop productivity. Dr. Leach is also a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of the Science and a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology. She is a member of the Board on Agriculture and Natural Resources of the US National Academy of Sciences. In May 2019, Dr. Leach was awarded the Agropolis Fondacion Louis Malassi International Scientific Prize for Agriculture and Food for Distinguished Scientist. This coming August 2020, she will be presented the past president of the American Phytopathological Society Award of Distinction. Dr. Leach. Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction, Nina. I'll show my screen. Are we good? Okay. Yep. Yes. Thank you. So thanks for the invitation to speak in this exciting session. And I'm in and I'm and I'm very honored to participate in the session with a number of distinguished scientists today. Today I'd like to talk to you and discuss one of the great challenges for agriculture and agricultural researchers, and that is the impacts of the changing climate on plant disease and how that affects crops in, in crop production. Um, sorry, I'm having some difficulties here. Major storms have always devastated farms worldwide, whether from damaging winds during a storm or erosion or landslides. But now, as many of you know, they're becoming more and more common. In the spring of 2018, for example, unusually heavy rains and snowstorms caused massive flooding in the US Midwest. The flooding inundated thousands of farm acres and farmers couldn't get into their fields to plant their crops. Thousands of livestock animals were killed, impact, and it, it not only impacted um, the farming systems, but those who depended on the farming system. These floods in the Midwest caused the losses of Midwestern farmers over $400 million in cattle and $440 million in crop species in one season alone. On the opposite extreme, drought is looming in many areas of the world and the lack of adequate water damages or destroys crops, dries up soils and threatens our livelihoods. Between 2014 and 2016, for example, in the state of California, 
an estimated $3.8 billion of direct statewide economic losses occurred due to drought. Drought and other climate change related conditions are exacerbating degradation of soils. It is truly frightening to me and I, I'm sure to you that 1.5 billion people already depend on degraded soils for survival and it's only gonna get worse. Growing seasons are starting earlier and getting hotter in the warming climates. And to us, we might think that a, a, an earlier growing season might be a good thing uh, in the short term. But, uh, but, they, but in the long term, the problems are that you may have increases in pest populations and more generations per year. Or early spring onset can result in uh, crops growing before they have the nu nutrients or the soil moisture that will help them to grow or it can ruin fruit crops if the spring um, uh, has late frosts. Increasing temperatures are fueling wildfires that are devastating farms around the world. This is an example in the US where ranchers in the West are experiencing major losses as a result of worsening fire seasons. These can not only come from charred grazing lands, but loss of life and decimated haystocks. The picture for agriculture's future is pretty bleak. The International Panel on Climate Change warned us in 2007 already that warming in the climate system is unequivocal. And in 2018, they reported that warming is happening faster and earlier than they had previously predicted. The predictions are that yields for key crops, the crops that feed the world, such as wheat, rice, maize, and soybean, will be negatively affected by only 1% or by only one degree temperature increases. And we're already observing those one degree increases around the world. For rice, the negative impacts of increasing temperatures in the environment are not just predictions. They have been documented. We're seeing increased nighttime temperatures that are not only reducing yields, but as those yields decline, we're seeing increases in release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere from the rice paddies. There are a lot of models um, that are out there being designed to predict what might happen and what we should do to manage it in these changing climate conditions as the temperatures incline. But until recently, there were lots of models and hypotheses but the empirical data that tells us what we might need to do helps guide our responses is only just becoming available. Why is this? It's because studying the interactions of crop plants with the environment, which includes the weather and the soil and other factors, as well as the complication of other biological and non-biological factors such as insects, um, microbes in the soil, on the plants, other weed species con, uh, uh, competing with the plants. The system is complex and we call this system, which is the interactions of the environment with the living organisms that influence or influenced by plants, the phytobiome. And to study this phytobiome, we can't just focus on one element at a time. We need to use a systems approach. So we need to embrace the complexity of the phytobiome. Because of the difficulty of studying these complex systems, plant pathologists or entomologists typically study the interaction of one organism, like a fungus and the plant, or a bacteria or an insect in a plant, and one crop, rice, wheat, whatever. They rarely uh, include the impact of the weather on the system or the type of the soil and how that impacts that interaction or the moisture in the soil. We need to think about this thing as a system if we're going to solve the problems that are facing us in the future. In the past 10 years, 
um, we've seen a number of advances that will help us solve these complicated problems. We've seen advances in systems level approaches uh, that will enable us to uh, characterize the environment and the uh, uh, biological and abiological, abiotic or, uh, components of that environment. We've seen the ability to handle large amounts of data that will enable us to combine the impacts of soil, the impacts of pathogens, the impacts of the weather on our systems. And in uh, microbiome discoveries, not only in the human, but the plant and ecological systems have shown us that there are patterns that we can look at and tease out if we look at enough data associated with those. We know that we need to do large longitudinal studies rather than just cross-sectional studies. And we also need to understand that there may be unexpected impacts on the host based on what we're seeing with microbiome interactions with host or human diseases and uh, humans. And also importantly, we're seeing that we can translate these, um, these, this information that we're gaining to treatments. For example, you hear of probiotics or fecal transplants in human systems. In agriculture, We've seen huge advance advances in precision ag where you can apply the right amount of a, of, a, a, of a fertilizer at the right site at the right time without spreading it throughout the field. And also decision support systems that help us predict what the impacts of, of these system, these in, uh, uh, environmental factors will be. It's important for us to understand that when we're looking at a phytobiome, the predicted effects of an increased temperature on the plant or the, but can be not only on the plant, or, but they can also be on the pathogen. And there are a number of things that we can measure to determine what those factors are, but we need to take all of this into account. Um, we, in, in my laboratory, we're interested in understanding what's happening at the disease system in an increasing temperature. And from a plant disease perspective, there's a simple reason why we need to study this as a system, or at least combinations of stresses on plants. It's because the outcome may not be what we predicted. For example, we may incorporate heat tolerance into a crop, or we may incorporate disease resistance into a crop. But a plant in a field is exposed to multiple stresses, and it can be exposed to heat and pathogen stress at the same time. And the unfortunate thing is that the outcome may not be what we predicted. For example, we may have spent years incorporating disease resistance into crop species, only to have that resistance fail if the environment changes. Today, I'd like to talk to you about my favorite plant and host system, which is um, rice and the bacterial blight pathogen, uh, which is the, the disease, a devastating disease that's found in rice production areas throughout uh, Asia. And I'll use this as an example to, uh, of how looking at the system might help us uh, understand better how to control this disease. Now in rice, most of you know that um, our sources of, of resistance to bacterial blight are single resistance genes. And the breeders will work for 10 to 15 years to integress resistance genes into rice. I don't have to, um, I, I don't ha have to assume that you're plant pathologists to know that the left side of the screen is healthy rice and the left, I'm sorry, the right side of the screen is diseased rice and the left side of the screen is healthy because there are single genes that have been introduced into that plant. Bacterial blight pressure has been known for some time to be worse at high in higher environmental temperatures. Um, it's been known since for in Japan, there were many studies that, just, uh, that demonstrated that the disease increases 
under increasing environmental conditions, under high temperatures in the environment. And this is exacerbated if the season is humid. The disease just goes rampant. And we can also replicate that in greenhouse and screenhouse conditions, which makes it a very nice system to study. I'll point out that when I talk about high temperature regimes, they're not that high. These are the average temperatures in the hot season in the Philippines, the day-night temperatures. And the blue are the cool temperatures, like, which I'm calling low temperatures, are 29 day and 21 night, which are more of the typical season, the cool season temperatures. But we know that there's increased disease at high temperatures, but what it, we don't really know, and we didn't really know how high temperatures would affect resistance to bacterial blight. So a few years back, um, we and our collaborators at the International Rice Research Institute looked at the responses of a number of rice bacterial blight disease resistance genes to combined stresses of high temperatures um, and bacterial blight. Most of the resistance genes lost efficacy at high temperatures. So the red is the high temperature, the blue is the low temperature. And so, for example, the XA4 gene, which is a widely deployed gene in Asia, resistance gene for bacterial blight that's deployed throughout Asia, almost lost efficacy at high temperatures. Whereas um, the interesting thing is that, and, and most other resistance genes that we looked at also lost efficacy. The interesting gene is this unusual, uh, exceptional gene called XA7. And it shows the opposite trend. At high temperatures, XA7 is more um, effective at controlling disease than at the low temperatures. It's a good resistance gene no matter what, but it's even better at high temperatures. So why do we care about that? We care about that because if XA7 confers higher levels, it may be a very useful resistance gene for us to incorporate into germplasm in areas of high temperature. And second, because if we can figure out why plants with XA7 are more resistant to high temperatures, we can also, we then might be able to develop strategies for improving rice to meet the demands of the future. So as I mentioned before, we're interested in looking at um, exploring both why resistance, why rice is more susceptible to disease at high temperatures and why some resistance genes like XA7 are more effective at high temperatures. As I indicated earlier, um, increasing temperatures may impact the host or the pathogen or both. So we've asked if high temperatures increase disease by increase, encouraging elevated populations of the pathogens. In a paper that was recently published from Nolly Vera Cruz's lab, uh, uh, her student Sylvester Dosa demonstrated that at high temperatures, as I mentioned earlier, there, are there is more disease or longer lesions on rice uh, than at low temperatures. What they did is they sectioned the plant from the inoculation site down to the leading edge of the lesion. And at low temperatures where the lesions had not progressed into this part of the leaf, they saw lower populations of bacteria. However, in the high temperature where the lesions had gone beyond uh, 10 centimeters up to about 14 centimeters, they saw that the populations of the bacteria remained hot, oops, sorry, back, I gotta go back. Uh, remained, were high relative to the, that same section in the low, the bacteria had spread further, but, um, in, and that the, the, those numbers in that distal portion contained higher amounts of bacteria, but overall, uh, we don't know from this if the bacteria are multiplying to higher, uh, faster or to higher, faster in these leaves. So we uh, conducted some multiplication assays of the bacteria in the laboratory, and you can see very clearly that as the 
as the temperature increases, bacterial multiplication decreases considerably. So this is at 35 degrees C. Well, we know this is in contrast to what you might expect given you see the increased spread of the bacteria and leaves at high temperature. So um, it's possible that the plant, uh, the temperature at the plant surface is lower than um, the environmental temperature. And of course, uh, Nolly's group at Erie has shown that this is true, that the bacterial temperature or the plant temperature on the surface of the leaves is about two to three degrees less than the environmental temperature. But overall, even taking that into account, um, increased disease at high temperature is not likely due to increased pathogen multiplication because we, we would still be in a zone where the bacteria would be inhibited. So given that, we turned our focus to the impacts on the host. We looked at gene expression patterns in plants undergoing heat and disease stresses individually or in combination to understand the impacts of, of high temperature on plant resistance responses and what happened in those in to the plant in the increased temperature stress responses. So Stephen Cohen, the student who performed this work, was asking two questions. Why are plants more susceptible to bacterial blight at high temperatures? And why are some resistance genes like XA7 more effective at those high temperatures? So he inoculated the plants and incubated them at high and low temperatures, performed a, a transcriptome analysis on the tissues that had been infiltrated with the bacteria, and then asked what genes and pathways are differently regulated by these two, di two different stress conditions. Now, I'm going to uh, just very briefly summarize what he found, because what I really want you to understand is how the, how, how the impact of one, one, the impact on plants of one stress condition can give one response. But when you add a second stress, you get very different responses. So what he found, and this is a way of looking at gene expression, these are genes uh, in, this, in this kernel plot that are ABA biosynthetic or responsive genes. And I'll tell you a little bit more about ABA in the next slide. But what I want you to notice is that if the plants were only treated with uh, uh, incubated at high temperature relative to low temperature, no, no pathogen present. We saw an increase in the uh, biosynthetic, the ABA biosynthetic and responsive gene expression. If the plants were incubated at high temperature and then treated with a, a, a pathogen that would lead to a susceptible interaction or disease, we saw even uh, more activation of ABA biosynthetic and responsive genes. So high temperature plus pathogen leads to higher ABA responses, ABA being uh, highly upregulated by heat. Interestingly, that very unique resistance gene XA7, when we inoculate plants that then would result in a resistant interaction at high temperature relative to normal temperature, the ABA biosynthetic and responsive genes are um, inhibited and inhibited to a large extent. So ABA is a, a plant hormone, abscisic acid is a plant hormone that is important for heat tolerance. So in, it, heat tolerant, heat is an abiotic stress and if you uh, have activation of ABA, you have adaptation to that heat stress and other abiotic stresses such as cold and drought and salt. Interestingly, ABA blocks resistance to pathogens. So it makes the plants more susceptible to disease by blocking resistance. And in fact, it has been shown that if you add ABA, um, to uh, rice plants, you see increased bacterial blight disease. 
So overall, what we're showing is that our hypothesis resulting from these studies is that during high temperature stress or heat and pathogen attack disease, rice favors the abiotic, uh, ab abiotic stress response pathway. You see the activation of ABA, so abiotic stress response. But if you add the XA7 resistance gene, we hypothesize that XA7 is more effective at controlling disease at high temperatures because it suppresses the abiotic defense response pathway, the, the ABA pathway, which in fact then allows the plant to resist the pathogens. So why do we care? Why is this important? Well, for one thing, knowing that at high temperatures, we activate ABA, which causes increased disease because it blocks resistance. And at high temperatures, if we have ABA in the presence of XA7, we, blo we, act, we block activation of ABA and therefore get resistance. What this tells us is that we may be able to use this to identify other sources of resistance or um, identify pathways that will bypass the ABA responses and make uh, plants more durable and effectively resistant at high temperatures. It also will help facilitate planning and breeding for sustainable crop production under conditions of increasing global temperatures. For example, what we really want to do is avoid making mistakes. We want to, um, if, and what I mean is that there may be a risk of enhance, if, that if we enhance heat tolerance by activating ABA, we may make plants more resistant or more susceptible to disease by blocking resistance. On the other hand, if we mimic XA7 mechanism for resistance, we may render the plants more susceptible to disease because we may, um, may, may be more susceptible to heat stress, I mean, because we're, we are now blocking the production of ABA. So we have to be careful. We have to think about what's going to happen if we try to um, uh, modulate with these combined stresses. So the bottom line of what I'm trying to say is that phytobiomes are complex systems. And in a changing climate, understanding the interactions of the components of this phytobiome is critical to sustainable crop health. So I hope I've convinced you that it's important to look at the complexity of the system and to think about what we're doing if we mod modify one part of that system without paying attention to the other parts of the system. And with that, I'd like to thank our many collaborators, uh, many from the Philippines, in fact, and uh, from around the world, and also to thank our many funding agencies. And also, again, thank you very much for your attention and for having me at this meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Leach. We now move to our second main guest lecturer, Dr. Milagros Hujilia Evangelista. Dr. Hujilia Evangelista has been a research chemist for more than 20 years at the USDA ARS National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research in Peoria, Illinois. She received her BS in food technology and MS in food science from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, and PhD in food technology from Iowa State University. She has authored more than 130 publications and presentations on value-added products, particularly proteins from processing of soybeans, corn, and alternative oilseed crops. She is a fellow of the American Oil Chemist Society and the American Institute of Chemists. Dr. Hegelia Evangelista, is a recipient of the 2018 Iowa State University Food Science and Human Nutrition Alumni Impact Award 
and the 2018 Distinguished Alumni Award of the College of Agriculture and Food Science at the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Dr. Ojilia Evangelista. Okay, I'm just getting my screen set up. Thank you, Dr. Nina Cadiz. I am honored to be here. Let me start with a brief overview of my agency. The Agricultural Research Service is the chief scientific in-house research arm of the USDA. It runs 700 research projects under 50 national programs with an annual budget of $1.2 billion. We have 8,000 staff stationed in more than 90 locations across the United States, of which four are regional research centers. Eastern Lab is in Widmore, Pennsylvania, Southern Lab in New Orleans, Louisiana, Western Lab in Albany, California, and the Northern Lab, now known as the National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research, is in Peoria, Illinois. And CAR is the largest of the regional research centers with 250 scientists and support staff working in search in seven research units. My group is Plant Polymer. Did you know that NCAR scientists developed the process to mass produce the antibiotic penicillin? For this impactful work, our center was named an International Historic Chemical Landmark. Our other discoveries have been transferred to many consumer products. The Plant Polymer Research Group does basic and applied research on modifying natural polymers and develops new bio-based products from agricultural commodities, like the Super Slurper modified cornstarch, which can absorb water in hundreds of times its weight. This starch is used in disposable diapers and in fresh meat packaging as liners. We currently have three umbrella projects and the work I'll present today is part of improved utilization of proteinaceous co-products from crops. There has always been interest in plant-based proteins, but the demand for them seemingly exploded this past five years. The demand is driven by a projected substantial growth in world population in 30 years and the consequent rise in protein consumption. Currently, soy and corn proteins dominate the US food and feed markets, but new plant-based sources have entered many sectors of the market with um, notable sales and growth. Still, more plant proteins are being sought. At our center, we have done the first studies on proteins in some alternative oilseed crops. Coriander is known to most people. It is cultivated as a summer or winter annual and is best known as a spice crop. The young plant is sold as the fresh herb cilantro. While the seeds from the mature plant are dried and sold as dried seeds, ground spice or extracted for its essential oil, which is used as a flavor agent or in personal care products. To tap the other components of coriander seed, we developed an integrated oil process that produced essential oil plus the triglycerides and a protein enriched meal for further extraction. Kufia seed has 25% protein and 32% oil that is rich in medium chain fatty acids and triglycerides. Kufia can be a domestic source of these fatty acids for use in detergents, cosmetics, and lubricants. Camelina is a plant in the mustard family. It grows in marginal lands and planted in rotation with wheat. Its seed has 30% protein and 40% oil, which is mainly unsaturated fatty acids 
that may have nutraceutical value. Pennycress is historically a weed. It is a winter crop that is planted in rotation with soybeans, which negates the food versus fuel issue. The seed has 25%, 21% rather, crude protein and around 30% oil, which is rich in erucic acid that is used in industrial lubricants. For these four oil crops, the press cake is the protein co-product of oil process and finding use for them will increase the value of the crops. Our research goals were to determine the chemical and functional properties of proteins in coriander, kufia, camelina, and pennycress, and identify the possible uses of these protein products. Our work determined the composition and soluble protein classes and the effects of oil pressing on protein properties. We performed bench scale extractions of the protein and tested the functional properties to identify possible uses. For pennycress, we scaled up the protein isolate production and tested the protein in films and fibers. The four oil seeds contained substantial oil ranging from 7, 18 to 35 percent. Protein contents ranged from 13 to 27 percent with coriander having the least amounts of both oil and protein, but the most amounts of fiber and carbohydrates. The polypeptides in the proteins are not very large. Coriander's five major bands were under 97 kilodaltons, while Kufia's major bands are under 53 kilodaltons. The brassica seed proteins showed 8 to 11 polypeptide bands, with the darkest ones resolving under 31 kilodaltons for camelina and 41 kilodaltons for pennycress. Knowledge of soluble proteins is helpful in crafting extraction methods. The soluble protein groups in the four oil seeds were extracted sequentially using water, saline, alcohol, acid, and alkali. Each supernatant was collected and freeze-dried. Its mass and protein contents were recorded. The glutilins make up about half of the protein groups in kufia, while globulins, albumins, and acid glutilins are the major fractions in camelina. In pennycress, globulins and albumins are dominant. The amino acid contents are a measure of protein nutritional quality. New plant proteins are often compared with soy protein. We use the amino acid score, which is the sum of the essential amino acids minus tyrosine, only as an initial indicator of protein quality. The essential amino acids of rapeseed are listed here for comparison with pennycress and camelina. Coriander's essential amino acid contents are like those in soybean, so not surprisingly, their amino acid scores are almost equal. Kufia's essential amino acid contents are lower, and so its amino acid score is also much less than that of soybean. Camelina's essential amino acid profile gave a score that was greater than kufia, but still less than soybean or rapeseed protein. The essential amino acids in pennycress compared well with both soy and rapeseed protein and had an amino acid score that exceeds those of soy or rapeseed protein. We extracted the proteins using the conventional acid precipitation method that was adapted by the soy protein industry. Dilute alkali was added to the ground sample 
and the mixture was stirred in a 50 degree C water bath for 90 minutes. After filtering and centrifuging, the protein in the supernatant was precipitated by adding HCl until pH 4.5. The recovered precipitate was redissolved in pH 7 water. After centrifuging, the supernatant was then ultrafiltered and freeze dried to obtain the protein product. For Pennycress, we also did a saline based extraction given its major protein groups. The freeze dried protein extracts had high purity. At least 90% proteins were in the uh, Pennycress protein extract, which would classify them as protein isolates. The 84% protein in coriander extract and the 80% protein in camelina extract classifies them as protein concentrates. For protein functionality tests, we first determined the solubility at this pH levels, followed by foaming and emulsifying properties and water holding capacity and heat coagulability. These four properties were tested at pHs where the protein was most soluble. And the details of these tests are described in our published papers. Coriander protein is least soluble at pH 4 and most soluble at pH 5.5 until 10. At this pH range, Coriander proteins are much more soluble than soy proteins. At pH 2, the proteins from the dehulled coriander samples were just as soluble as soy proteins. On the other hand, kufia seed proteins were poorly soluble from pH 4 to 7 and highly soluble at pH 10. So food use is likely out for kufia protein. Meanwhile, the solubility of camelina proteins more closely resembles that of soy protein with highest solubility at pH 8.5 and pH 2. The saline extracted pennycress seed protein is much more soluble than the acid precipitated protein showing 80% solubility from pH 7 to 10. The proteins from the press cake were even more soluble, especially the saline extracted press cake isolate, which was highly soluble across all pH values. And this behavior is like that of whey protein. Coriander proteins formed substantial foams. The, de, uh, the dehulled coriander proteins had far greater foaming capacity than the whole fruit. This capacity was sustained at pH 2 and pH 10. There's a red dashed line here to indicate the value for soy protein. And as you can see, the foam capacity of coriander protein was still less than that of soy protein at pH 7. So in the next slides, when you see the dash red lines, that, that would indicate the soy protein value. We noted the same results for foam stability. Overall, coriander proteins formed stable foams just like soy protein. Kufia press cake proteins had higher foaming capacity than that of its seed proteins, but the foams collapsed right away. So the foaming properties of kufia are actually poor. Pennycrest proteins also formed substantial foams with some samples having foam volumes that were comparable to that of soy protein. The foams were generally stable with most of the samples showing at least 90% uh, remaining foam after standing for 15 minutes. 
coriander proteins were excellent emulsifiers with activity index values that were much greater than the 56 meters square per gram protein recorded for soy at pH 7. These bars are four to six times greater than the activity value for soy protein. Emulsion stability values like the EAI values also increased with pH. The least amounts were recorded at pH 2. But at pH 7, note that the stability values were greater than that for soy. So coriander protein emulsions are actually more stable than soy protein emulsions. Kufia's press cake proteins had much greater emulsion activity index values than the seed protein. But it is the seed protein that formed the more stable emulsions. Pennycrest seed proteins, especially the saline extracted press cake proteins, showed excellent emulsifying activity and the values increased with pH. You can see here that their EAI values were much greater than that for soy. But it is the acid precipitated Pennycrest protein isolates that formed the more stable emulsions with their values almost twice those of the other Pennycrest protein samples. Kufia protein's WHC value was unremarkable, but it does match the 3.5 grams of water recorded for soy protein WHC. Pennycrest seed and press cake proteins also match the WHC of soy protein, but it is the isolates at pH then that gave much higher water holding capacity values. Heat coagulability is expressed as the percent loss of protein solubility. The Pennycrest protein isolates and the protein in the seed meal were most stable to heating at pH 2. What this means is if you add Pennycrest protein, say to fruit juice and pasteurize it, there is a low chance of the protein getting denatured and it will retain its functionality. Note that it is the acid precipitated isolate that is very stable across all pH points tested. Camelina protein was also stable to heating, especially at pH 7 and pH 10, which is in contrast to that of Pennycrest protein. It is the coriander proteins that are most stable at pH 2, 7, and 10, and among the three crops that we evaluated for heat coagulability. So, to summarize, coriander proteins were most soluble at pH 2 and greater than 5.5. They had excellent foaming and emulsifying properties and were stable to heat treatment. They can be used in uh, pressurized foam products or as emulsifier, protein additive, or suspending agent, which is which we actually tested for vanilla grounds and found that coriander proteins were quite effective in keeping the particulates dispersed. Kufia protein has glutalins as the major protein fraction and not surprisingly, it is highly soluble in alkaline pH. Its emulsifying properties were comparable to soy protein and it may be used as emulsifiers in paints or in wood adhesives, just like what we did for soy protein. Wood adhesives have pH around 11. Camelina proteins have globulins, acid glutalins, and albumins as the major protein classes. It is most soluble at pH 2 and 10. Its solubility behavior is like that of soy protein, 
and it is highly stable to heat treatment. It may be used as a thickener or viscosity agent, as emulsifier or protein additive. Lastly, the pennycrest seed proteins have albumins and globulins as the major protein classes. They are highly soluble depending on the extraction uh, method that is used. They have excellent emulsifying and foaming properties. They are stable to heat treatment and their water, water holding capacity is greater than that of soy protein. We tested them in films and as you can see, it has a colored but clear fair, uh, film. We tested them in spun fibers and also as a suspending agent for vanilla grounds, just like what we did for coriander proteins. And they were also effective in keeping the particulates dispersed. Other possible uses are as emulsions, whipped product, pressurized foams, or protein additive. And I would like to thank all our colleagues at NCAR who helped us and contributed greatly to the completion of these research projects. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much again for inviting me to this uh, session. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much to our two main guest lecturers, Dr. Leach and Dr. Ojilia Evangelista. I now give the floor to my co-host, Dr. Palier, for the Q&A portion. Okay. Um, good morning. So we have here um, a number of questions in the Q&A uh, box. First, a uh, question from Dr. Asuncion Raimundo for uh, Dr. Leach. Hi, Jan. I'd like to read the question and the uh, comment. Hi, Jan. Nice to see you again, even just virtually. Excellent presentation as usual. Thanks for accepting to talk in this session. So the question is, um, since ABA or ABA gene is important, do plant breeders, I can read. Do plant breeders consider it in their plant disease resistance programs at present? Hi, Sean, thanks for the question. I think, I hope everyone knows that Sean and I have been close friends for a long, long, long time. So it's good to hear from her again. Um, yes, ABA uh, genes and are important. And we think that this is a key node in the defense response pathway. Um, usually breeders take ABA responsive and biosynthetic genes um, it, it, they take them into account in breeding for drought stress or, or heat stress or cold stress, not so much for disease. And I think it's because um, we've not seen this association played out so closely. Uh, it's known that they're involved in disease, but it's not known uh, to what level. So I think it, this opens up the door to a lot more questions uh, and a lot more research. I wish I were 20 years younger. Okay. Um, so this question actually was upvoted four times. Um, another question from uh, Dr. Uh, Ronilo Jose Flores for Dr. Evangelista. Thank you for your presentation. Were you able to identify some other active dominant proteins in the seed protein fractions via HPLC or GCMS or LCMS maybe? Thank you. Uh, no, because at the time that uh, we were doing the experiments, that was, uh, these are all uh, unknown proteins. So we were doing essentially the, the primary analysis to give some indication of how much protein there is, is it extractable, uh, what are some of the critical functional properties of the protein. Um, now that we have established those, we can certainly um, perform more in-depth studies of the other components of the protein. But at the time that we, we performed the experiments, no, we did not go in-depth. 
Okay. Thank you very much. So this uh, question was also upvoted four times. Another question for uh, Dr. Lich. Uh, thank you very much from Emmanuel Gandalera. So he, he said, thank you very much, Professor Jan Lich. I see that we have a dilemma with either enhancing heat tolerance in plants or enhancing pathogen resistance. Situationally, the Philippines is located in the tropics and experiences high temperatures, and at the same time, farmers are affected by bacterial blight. Based on your team's research, and for some researchers that we have here, uh, may you give us some insights on how are we going to proceed with, the solving, with solving this problem? Thank you very much, and we really appreciate your talk. Well, thank you for the question. This is an excellent question because we are facing a dilemma of if we make the plants resistant to one stress, do we make them more susceptible to another kind of stress? And I think we're just beginning to, to grab, grasp that. But obviously in nature, um, the plants have, is, uh, historically we have done a reasonably good job of breeding for resistance. And I think it's probably done blind, it's not blind breeding, they're wonderful breeders, but it's, it's because they're selecting for drought tolerance in fields that have disease. So they have, by the very way that they select for the resistance, um, enhanced resistance to disease or enhanced resistance to drought in the environment and in different environments, they've helped to overcome this problem. What we need to understand if we're to keep ahead of it is what are the reasons, what are the, what's the physiological basis for the plants being adapted to both stresses at the same time um, so that we can keep ahead of it and think about it. And, and you know, we really don't know the answer to a lot of that, at least, at least I don't. I'm sure someone smarter than me does, but we, we really need to think about this very carefully. Okay. Okay, thank you, um, Dr. Lich. One last question in the interest of time. We can only entertain one last question uh, from Dr. Cadiz herself. Uh, for Dr. Lich, why ABA? How about um, ethylene, for instance, which is also a stress hormone like ABA? That's an excellent question. So why not other stress hormones like ethylene? It's interesting, and um, in the paper that we published that uh, contains this research, we did find that there, were, there was upregulation of ethylene, um, of course, in the heat stress, as you would expect. But interestingly, it was not upregulated in the disease stress or in the resistant interactions to the same levels that it was. I don't know why that is. There must be some crosstalk with the hormones. Another interesting hormone is salicylic acid, which is a, a known disease resistance protein, which was of course um, upregulated to a certain extent in the, in the resistant interactions, but not as much with XA7. A lot of interesting things have come out of this. And there, there are a lot of, a lot of um, things that we didn't expect, like why not ethylene? Why, and why not more response with salicylic acid? And what about jasminate, which is another stress response protein? So we have a lot of questions because we're looking at dual stresses, which we hadn't done before. Okay. Sorry, I have no answers. <laughs> okay. uh, maybe we can entertain uh, two last questions. Just a quick question here uh, from Lani Lariosa. What is the harvest result rate of your research? Uh, so far, we don't know. Uh, we, it hasn't, um, it, actually, Nolly Veracruz would be a better person to answer that question because she was at, in the Philippines for uh, Yuri for years. I think the answer is that we're beginning to understand that the XA7 resistance gene is really important for many reasons. It's very durable. And Nolly has been a leader in that area. So I think um, we can't take credit for a huge amount of, of progress or yield 
rates increased. But I think getting these understandings is helping direct what what are genes to put into the plants in, in the future, hopefully, what are genes we put in as the, the climate changes. But uh, I don't think we can take credit for a huge amount of yield increase yet. Okay, so uh, one last question from um, Doc, uh, Paolo Arejola. We are currently developing the mark the market for microbial inoculants and biostimulants. We are also trying to educate the farmers on the use and inclusion of these products in their farming systems. What is your opinion regarding these microbial inoculants and biostimulants regarding their effects on the overall plant health? Thank you. And I think it's really important that we look to microbial inoculants and biostimulants more into the future. But again, we need to think about the system. So what I would strongly recommend uh, before, before marketing um, these, these organisms, which are important, modification of the microbiome is gonna be critical to success in the future. But we need to think about what, if you apply these microbial inoculants that enhance plant growth, what other thing, have you tested what other stresses these might impact? Maybe they will help you with drought stress because we know that some microbes help plants tolerate drought stress. But I think it, it's wise to look at other stresses before we, we uh, go too far down the path of, of uh, using them. I think this is a very important part of our future is using microbials. And one last question for Dr. Evangelista from Dr. Flores. Thank you for clarifying uh, my questions a while ago. It would be great to have a, lab a library for pennycress since it is considered to have medicinal properties. Is this something that your team is considering to research on? Uh, no, because the medicinal properties is beyond the mission of our uh, research projects in the unit. But I have read that uh, it does have medicinal properties. Yeah, okay. So thank you very much. Um, the floor, I'm giving the floor to Professor Cadiz for our next speaker. Thank you, Rachel. The question on microbial inoculant, I think, could be answered better by another speaker, Dr. Virginia Cuevas, later on. So we now move to the first session speaker who is actually my co-host, Dr. Rachel Pallier. She is a professor and UP scientist of the Animal Biology Division, Institute of Biological Sciences, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. Her research interest is parasitology, focusing on the role of parasites in various ecosystems and their impact on public health. She has authored several scientific articles, book chapters, and laboratory manuals in parasitology. Dr. Parlier is also an officer of the Philippine Society of Parasitology Incorporated, and she obtained her doctoral degree from the Graduate School of Health Sciences in Kobe University, Japan. Dr. Parlier. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Cadiz for your kind introduction. Let me just um, share. Okay, so screen share. So um, thank you for uh, this opportunity to share our research results regarding the role of agriculture intensification on the emergence of zoonotic diseases. Okay. So we all know that access to safe food is in itself an element of food security. Okay. So the World Health Assembly Resolution on Food Safety stated that everyone should have the right to an adequate supply of safe and nutritious food and that there is a need to implement a national and regional or local me mechanisms for foodborne disease surveillance. And also each government should take the necessary measures 
to ensure the availability of safe food for all in order to sustain the health and economic development of their people. Foodborne diseases are those that are the results of pathogenic microorganisms such as bacteria, virus, parasite, um, and parasites. No? So this may also be due to chemical substances such as pesticide residues, veterinary drugs, food additives, and many others, uh, which tend to have acute effects on human health. So the problem usually arises uh, due to contaminated food. So the WHO estimates that one in every three people worldwide suffer from FBD every year, and that 2 million people die every year from severe food and waterborne diarrheal related illnesses. Most of these illnesses are due to microorganisms and chemical contaminants. Um, in developing countries, in the Philippines particularly, some cases of FBD are not reported and therefore the true dimension of the problem is unknown. Um, the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Health Organization in 2018 released a list of food linked to outbreak associated diseases. So we can see here in the pie chart that in recent years, outbreaks of foodborne illness linked to fruits and vegetables are on the rise. The fruits and vegetables, um, we know they are healthy for our well-being, providing essential vitamins and minerals and fibers. Um, these fruits and vegetables once were thought to be relatively free of disease-producing pathogens. But outbreaks have been linked to pathogens as, as Escherichia coli 015787, which could be fatal, particularly to immunocompromised individuals. Salmonella were uh, reported from apples, lettuce, cantaloupe, and sprouts. Listeria monocytogens, um, contaminating cabbage and cantaloupe. Shigella in parsley and lettuce. Cyclospora in berries. Toxoplasma in fruits and vegetables. And uh, soil transmitted helminths like ascaris, whipworms, hookworms, contaminating also um, vegetables. Okay. So changes in the dynamics of these pathogens have undoubtedly contributed to the increase um, of pathogens no, in the farm. So including the impacts of climate change and other anthropogenic activities as well as changes in growing, harvesting, distribution, processing, and consumption practices. Contamination may occur at several points along the food chain, in the farm or in the field, during processing or post-harvest, at the market or at the point of sale, or at household level. So the... The farm is a perfect ecosystem where environment, animal, and human interact. So we, we call this as the environment, animal, human interface. Farms are potential ground for contamination. Farm produce are vehicle of transmission for microbial and parasitic infection. Some vegetables are eaten raw and parasites are able to live and infect potential hosts. Despite reports of several outbreaks worldwide, not much has been studied regarding parasite contamination at the farm level. Unfortunately, there is no such thing as parasiticide, uh, which we can apply in the farm. We have insecticide, fungicide, malusicide, but there's no such thing as parasiticide. Moreover, expansion of agriculture promotes encroachment into wildlife habitat such as agroforestry, leading to ecosystem changes and bringing human and livestock into close proximity to wildlife and potential vectors. 
There are several examples by which agricultural expansion and environmental changes were associated with an increased risk of zoonotic diseases emergence. And these are driven by the impact of expanding human population and changing human behavior on the environment. In fact, some studies mention that the rate of future zoonotic disease emergence or re-emergence will be closely linked to the evolution of the agriculture and environment nexus. We have done several research works which are proof of the role of agricultural practices linked to zoonotic transmission of parasites. Now, this is a recent paper we published and available um, as open access. So you may read them uh, for your information. We also have investigated the extent of parasite contamination in environmental samples like the soil in the farms, in selected organic and conventional farms in the Philippines, as well as uh, examining the freshly harvested vegetables not from the farms. We also tested um, composted manure used as organic fertilizers and we found, we found that they are also contaminated with parasites. So just to give you a picture, a summary of the results that we have done, of the research that we have done, the prevalence of parasite contamination of freshly harvested vegetables ranged from 15 to 35 percent. Uh, higher prevalence was reported during dry season um, and higher contamination of vegetables, surprisingly, from organic than in conventional farms. And later on, I will explain why uh, there was higher contamination in organic than in conventional farms. Also, remarkably, leafy vegetables found to be uh, higher incidence of parasite contamination than fruit vegetables like tomatoes or cucumber. So these are um, pie charts showing the proportion of parasites that we have harvested. We have um, Ascaris, you are familiar with Ascaris, um, which show the higher prevalence. Tricuris, 26%. Uh, Hookworms, uh, these are common parasites of animals and humans. Toxocara is a parasite of dog. Uh, tinea and other parasites can be also found in uh, animals and humans. Uh, surprisingly, these parasites that we have harvested or recovered from the farms are also common among our children. In fact, more than 50% of our children in the Philippines are infected with Ascaris, Tricuris, and hookworms. Now, these are just photograph, photographs of the parasites that we have recovered from vegetables, from soil, and envi other environmental samples in the farm. And just to show you that um, we have harvested more parasite from, parasites from organic farms that, than in conventional farms. Uh, among the vegetables, so we classified them into leafy vegetables and fruit vegetables. Leafy vegetables were found to be uh, more contaminated with green eyes showing higher uh, incidence of parasite contamination. So this is an example or a photograph of green eyes. So we hypothesize that because of the crevices, then the parasite eggs or larvae may be, uh, uh, they may be attached on, the, on those crevices and therefore if not properly washed, you know, may uh, be source of contamination to consumers. Um, the presence of parasites on fresh produce may be attributed to what primarily come in contact with them. Uh, so we tested the wash water use in the farms, the soil, of course, where the crops are planted. The animal feces uh, were also uh, assessed. And uh, we also collected fecal samples from the farmers. And surprisingly, all were found to be contaminated and um, the, all animals were also uh, found positive. You know, all farm animals, even domestic animals like uh, dogs and pets were found to be contaminated or infected with parasites. So to summarize, the parasites in human fecal samples are from farmers. The animal fecal samples 
soil and wash water use in the farms showed positive association with the incidence of parasite contamination in farm produce. Uh, we also um, recorded some farming practices uh, and results revealed that open water sources, the use of manure, presence of animals, some sanitation and hygiene practices of the farmers contribute to parasite contamination. So we also did molecular analysis. This is very important to identify the uh, specific species of the parasite and therefore know the exact source of these parasites. So uh, the Ascaris was found to be Ascaris suum. Suum is specific only for pigs. Tricuris, uh, we found Tricuris tricura and suis from humans and pigs respectively. Toxocara is canis species from dogs. Hymenolepis, where diminuta and nana from rats. Hookworms were found to be Ancylostoma cellanicum, which is a hookworm of dogs. Palantidium, coli species from pigs. Angiostrongylus cantonensis from rats. Then Echinastoma malayanum from rats. And Jarja intestinalis of subtypes A and B from humans. So we see here that the sources of uh, parasite contamination were from um, farm animals and the uh, uh, domestic animals and also humans in the farms. So the possible contamination um, sources therefore are raw or improperly composted manure, contaminated wash water and irrigation, presence of animals including pets, rodents and wild uh, animals in the farms that, that may encroach in the uh, agriculture setting, lack of field sanitation, and cross-contamination. So we summarize here the parasite transmission dynamics in the food supply chain, uh, starting from infected animals in the farms that may contaminate crops and other animals that uh, subsequently uh, have impact on the production process and the next level of the food supply chain. But human factors such as education, awareness, socioeconomic status, health and well-being, and cultural practices also have impact on this uh, transmission dynamics. So we have to control this uh, at various level through um, good farming practices and also therapeutic and preventive treatment like uh, the warming of our animals in the farms, including, the hum uh, including humans. And then uh, for control of parasites, there should also be a mechanism for surveillance at the regional level or local level, detection and removal of parasites uh, in the farms, and uh, removal of the contaminated food from the food supply chain. So there are several challenges and um, future directions for um, elucidating parasite contamination at the different levels of the food supply chain. One is elucidating the role of culture, socioeconomic and governance, the impact of climate change. We can also do modeling uh, for predictive studies, improve diagnosis using molecular or, or immunodiagnosis or even omic studies, and interdisciplinary interagency approach is, are also very important in addressing uh, our questions regarding zoonotic transmission. So there should be a coordinated effort to bring the resources of modern science to bear on the control of foodborne illnesses. And the approach is one health. If you want to have, um, to address human health, we need to address animal health as well and the environment health. So I'd like to also recognize the efforts of my uh, um, students and research assistants and uh, funding agencies of our researches. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Rachel Pallier. So if you have questions, just type your questions there and will be addressed after the session speakers. The second session speaker is Dr. Myra O. Villarreal. Dr. Villarreal obtained her BS Agriculture and MS Microbiology degrees from the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, and has previously worked for Peter Paul Philippine Corporation and the Ateneo de Manila University. 
At present, she is an associate professor at the Faculty of Life and Environmental Sciences of the University of Tsukuba, Japan, from where she obtained her PhD in 2011. She is interested in food functionality research, specifically in the use of natural products from foods for melanogenesis and anti-cancer functionalities. She has authored and co-authored more than 30 publications. Dr. Villarreal. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Cadiz, for this uh, opportunity to talk about one of our lab's uh, research uh, topics. Um, today, I uh, will talk about the natural products effect on melanogenesis. Good morning, everyone. So we've all seen this somewhere, probably on our way to school and or while we're in the mall. And we can all agree that uh, the first thing that you'll notice is that uh, the, the models, these beautiful models have different skin colors. And um, although they have different skin um, color, um, the cells that are responsible for skin pigmentation, which is called the melanocytes, they're actually the same. In terms of number of melanocytes, every person has the same number of melanocytes. However, due to geographical location, such as for those people in, in Africa, they have darker skin color because they produce more melanin, while people in European uh, countries have lighter skin color um, because of their location. So this is also not surprising. When, it's also not surprising when we hear of uh, the high incidence of skin cancer melanoma among Australians. And that is because most Australians are originally from Europe and not from Australia. So um, let's talk about the cells that produce uh, the pigment melanin. So that's the melanocyte. In this, uh, the photo on the on a, photos A and B would just show you the location of these cells in the dermis or in the epidermis of the skin. So photo B actually have the MITF uh, stained to, in order for us to identify uh, which uh, cells would be the melanocyte. And uh, pigmentation, as we all know, is not unique to humans. We also observe pigmentation in Madaka goldfish, which is also used as a model uh, in vivo uh, for, for model as a model for in vivo studies on pigmentation. We also know, have uh, pigmentation in dogs, in mice, as well as in polar bears. And mutations in the genes encoding key signaling molecules or transcription factors result in characteristic coat color phenotypes. So if you look at the, the mice here, it's probably not very important to, to most people, but if you're a mouse being uh, chased by a cat, your color would spell your life or your death. So what is the melanin or pigmentation for? So primarily, as we know, we've learned this in school, is that the melanin protects us from the UV radiation. So we are aware that there are different wavelengths. We have the visible light, we have the UVA, UVB, and UVC. So if you notice, most of your um, protective lotion from the sun would be against UVB. And that is because the wavelength would actually be targeting the melanocyte at the specific uh, layer of your skin. So it's very important that we get protection uh, uh, from UVB uh, rather than from UVC or, or UVA, although uh, that could also have some adverse effect. What, uh, what other reasons do we have for studying um, melanogenesis? There are pigmentation disorders as uh, shown by this uh, photo. This is melasma or a hyperpigmentation disorder. Another one would be hypopigmentation as uh, as shown in this uh, right photo. And both uh, um, pigmentation disorders have adverse effect on, um, on an individual causing uh, mental stress, for example. And uh, aging is also affected. And as we age, we also observe uh, hair graying. And uh, that could also be another target uh, for studying pigmentation. So at the center of the pigmentation, uh, 
studies would be this uh, transcription factor called the microphthalmia associated transcription factor or MITF. So MITF is the master regulator of melanocyte development, function and survival by modulating various differentiation and cell cycle progression genes. And at the same time, it's also an amplified oncogene in a fraction of human melanomas, and that it also has an oncogenic role in human clear cell sarcoma and other cancers. So MITF is between instructing melanocytes towards terminal differentiation or pigmentation uh, development, and alternatively promoting malignant behavior. So how do we regulate MITF expression? So this uh, photo would illustrate the regulation at the transcription level, A and B would show you how we can regulate uh, the MITF protein. So MITF uh, gene expression is also under the transcriptional regulation of several uh, transcription factors such as the beta catenin, the Pax3, SOX10, CREB, and others. And uh, the produced or the translated MITF or the protein could also be regulated by MAP kinases and CBP, P300, ubiquitination, and others. So this is a simplified schematic uh, showing features of key regulatory pathways in the melanocyte lineage, which is also what I like to call as a map on how we can regulate pigmentation in mammals. So later I'll talk about natural products and how they can all, and uh, the products, natural products that can regulate MITF. But here you can see how other natural products can also regulate MITF. So you have here the ligands or receptors that could be affected, the signaling molecules uh, right after it, and the transcription factors, and uh, the target genes. So center to this would be the MITF, and MITF would basic, could basically um, inhibit uh, pigmentation by because it is the transcription factor for the melanogenesis enzymes, which are the enzymes that uh, mediate uh, the synthesis of melanin. So if you have a natural product and uh, you want to check for the effect on pigmentation, you can basically check for the effects on these molecules. So just uh, a brief uh, um, information about how we produce melanin. So we need the uh, tyrosine, which is also the precursor for other molecules such as, the, such as neurotransmitters. But for melanin, we have the two types. We have the eumelanin and the femelanin. We need the tyros we need tyrosine. And the rate limiting enzyme for this is the tyrosinase, as well as the tyrosinase related protein one and DCT. Therefore, to directly affect uh, pigmentation, you want to regulate this enzyme's expression and um, upstream to that would of course be their transcription factor, which is the MITF. So in our lab, uh, we use uh, different uh, plants, including medicinal plants and foods, and uh, we study their effect on uh, different biological processes, including melanogenesis. So natural products, uh, is the single most productive source of leads for the development of drugs. And do you know that about half of the drugs approved since 1994 are actually natural products based? And natural products uh, is not limited to plants. They could also come from microbes and animals, as well as the synthetic or semi-synthetic natural products. So at present, we have this project uh, that valorizes the uh, bioresources in semi-arid and arid land for regional development. And one of the processes we check is melanogenesis. And these are just some of the plants that we, that we worked on. So one particular plant of interest is this Stimulea hirsuta. And it is uh, particularly significant to us because it's rich in Daphnan type diterpenoids which have been reported to have anti-cancer effect and the extract itself is known to have an effect on metabolism. So two of the pure compounds that were identified uh, in our laboratory by Miamaital would be Hersenes A and B. And, uh, and uh, the other plants that we also work on are on this, uh, in this slide, the Erica multiflora and C. spinosa. And the initial screening using these B16 melanoma cells. So for our research, we use uh, pigment cells 
um, one of which is this B16 uh, murine melanoma cell. So just treating this uh, mammalian cell with the extracts of these three plants, you can immediately see the effect on the cells, uh, on the cells melanin uh, uh, production. So in this uh, test tubes photo, um, you can see that Erica multiflora EM made the lysate darker, and that means that more melanin were produced. And then the thymy layer suta had less uh, melanin, and Caparis spinosa had also more melanin produced based on this. So that's uh, an, an initial test that you can perform to see how plants uh, extract could actually regulate uh, melanogenesis. So we uh, we evaluated or we quantified the melanin produced uh, by the cells after treating the cells with Thymelia hirsuta. And you can see in this graph that there is a dose dependent uh, effect on the melanin uh, production, but there was no effect on the cell viability. And if you look at the expression of the tyrosinase enzyme, you can see that there was also a significant decrease in the Thymelia hirsuta uh, tyrosinase expression. So well, focusing on the cure compounds here, saying A and B, we also observed a dose-dependent effect. This is for hearsane A, and this is for hearsane B. And this is a positive uh, control for melanin inhibition, arbutin, or something that is uh, probably found in your, present in your whitening lotion. And uh, also, what we also observe is that even after just four hours, the cell's uh, morphology also changed. And that could also be an indication of differentiation in addition to the regulation of melanogenesis. So we looked at the expression of MITF as affected by the treatment of these uh, pure compounds. And we can see that uh, these uh, two compounds from <coughs> family Suta also significantly inhibited the MITF expression as well as the enzymes expression. So this was also accompanied by a decrease in the expression of the protein of tyrosinase, the enzyme. And uh, we also evaluated the mechanism of the effect of just for hearsay A using DNA microRNA, and we can see that most of the genes that were significantly uh, regulated were either MITF targets or genes that actually regulate also MITF. So um, these are in this uh, um, photo, and you can also learn about this more on this article that we have published on this topic. And uh, just going back to the differentiation effect, we can see that here's in A also changed the way the cells would grow in the culture plates as uh, shown here. So other products that we also work on uh, that also has an effect on melanogenesis or MITF would be this 345 tri orthocafilkinic acid or TCQA, which you can find in coffee and purple sweet potato. You can see in this photo of this uh, of these mice that the the coat color was actually uh, darker than the control, and also the growth was also faster. And we can also see that MITF was significantly increased by TCQA in both the at the transcriptional and at the translational level. So another one plant that we worked on is this uh, Tara and it's uh, tannin or Tara tannin also inhibited or rather promoted uh, uh, MITF. So Thymelea hirsuta inhibited MITF, but uh, trichophilkinic acid and Tara tannin promoted MITF and promoted uh, pigmentation as you can see here. So this is a summary of how um, Tara tannin modulated uh, or rather regulated MITF through these other upstream um, molecules being targeted by teratadine. And uh, just to summarize, uh, natural products may be used to regulate MITF for both pigmentation related or cancer related studies. And there is also a need to focus more on the earlier signals to determine how natural compounds regulate MITF expression. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'm ready to answer questions later. I would also like to thank uh, uh, our laboratory head, Professor Estada, and the two students who worked on tyrotanin and TCQA. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Villarreal. 
our next uh, speaker is Dr. Virginia C. Cuevas. Dr. Cuevas is a professor emeritus at the Institute of Biological Sciences, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. She specializes in environmental biology, plant fungal ecology. As a scientist, Dr. Cuevas has developed agricultural technologies. These are the trichoderma activator for rapid composting of agricultural waste and the trichoderma microbial inoculant or TMI for which she has obtained a patent. Her TMI is being used widely in the Philippines as crop growth promoter, biocontrol of crop pathogens, and as biofertilizer. Dr. Cuevas is a presidential awardee and was presented the Rizal Pro Patria Outstanding Agricultural Scientist Award. She has numerous awards in teaching, research, and public service. Dr. Cuevas is a member of the prestigious National Academy of Science and Technology as academician. Dr. Cuevas? Uh, I'm, okay, sorry. I'm still getting ready with my presentation. Okay, thank you, Dr. Cadiz, for the introduction and good morning to all participants. My paper is entitled In Situ Rises for Composting and the Use of Trichoderma Microbial Inoculant Possible Adaptive Strategy to Climate Change Phenomenon in Lowland Rice Cropping. The data that I am going to present would, were generated from this particular research project ongoing, where I am the project leader and funded by Bureau of Agriculture Research under Department of Agriculture. My co-researchers are Dr. Banaay, Ms. Marisa Luna, Dr. Agam Cuevas, and we are implementing a multidisciplinary type of research. Now, situationary. Our study area is in the province of Marinduque. It's an island province between Quezon and Mindoro Island. And our uh, municipality is Mugpog. There were two mining companies that are no longer operational today. That's come, uh, the Consolidated Mines Incorporated and Mark Copper. CMI operated in Mugpog, but Mark Copper operated in uh, Buac and Santa Cruz. But the ponds, the dams for tailings, which was breached in 1996 and 90, 1993 and 96, and inundated the rice paddies along the Mungpo River and continuously affecting our rice paddies up to the present. So this is the conceptual, conceptual framework of the project. On this left-hand corner will be the environmental situation where contamination of agricultural areas led to heavy metal toxicity that resulted in decreased crop productivity resulting to low income from poor, uh, poor harvest and resulted in exacerbating poverty for the host community. So our project intervention would be addressing contamination by remediation, using compost of plant residues and use of microbial inoculant, which promote plant growth and control pests. We believe that we will be able to address poverty, alleviating poverty through increased productivity. And our strategy, I believe, is sustainable because we are capacitating the farmers through series of training and we are addressing the problem of the agricultural lands. Now, this is actually uh, the last in my series of projects whose main activity is to rehabilitate agricultural lands that have been damaged by rock mine waste. And we have already published a series of articles on the topic of the role of compost or soil organic matter in alleviating copper toxicity and the role of TMI in increasing productivity in contaminated agricultural land. Okay, so in 2017, when we started our project, the very first thing we study the soil of, based on local knowledge, we were able to identify the different barangays that are affected by mine tailings. And in 
two barangays, we found out the contamination is very severe because even at one meter depth, the uh, level of copper is more than 300 milligrams per kilogram. And these are the data that we have. There were 12 or more barangays that are heavily affected. And based on literature, if copper is present in parent material, up to 100 milligrams per kilogram will be considered as normal. And since the two mining companies are extracting copper minerals from the rocks, we believe that uh, this will hold true. So what we did was to categorize, we group the price by this into three, copper, uh, soil copper will be 42, and that will be uh, milligrams per kilogram, and that will be still considered as normal. Now, rice paddies with 110 to 144 contaminate, milligrams per kilogram to be contaminated, and those greater than 290 milligrams per kilogram are severely contaminated. Now, our uh, focus of our study would be the effect of rice stroke compost and PMI, on yield of rice in copper rich paddies coupled with water stress. We have around 100 farmer cooperators and our farmer cooperators are resource poor. They are mostly tenants. They cultivate on the average only half hectare. And due to financial constraints, most cannot apply the required amount of chemical fertilizers. They do not even have funds to buy fuel for the motor park pump for irrigation, and this will be very critical during drought periods. In a good year, meaning to say no water stress, the mean yield in the area will be only 3.3 tons per hectare, which is way below the national average of four tons per hectare. Now, this will be the, some pictures on our rice paddies. Now, in the background here will be the CMI mined out area. So we'll have seepage from these mined out areas. And Barangay Kapayan is one of the most heavily uh, damaged. And this is where we found that at one meter level, the copper content is still greater than 390 milligrams, uh, 300 milligrams per kilogram. Our second site would be the barangays that were affected by mark copper mine tailings. No, so for methodology, um, from the 100 farmer cooperators, we selected at least 15 and made uh, observations for four cropping seasons from 2018 and 2019, which are El Nino years. In the treated paddies, we have rice straw from previous harvest scattered in the paddy. And then we mix trichoderma activator with triple 14 and then broadcasted this mixture over the straw. And the straws were incorporated in the soil during land preparation. The alai seeds were coated with trichoderma microbial inoculant. For the control or rice by these farmers' practice, the rice straws were discarded and the palai seeds were not coated with PMI. We monitored closely the amount of fertilizer applied for both paddies. Farmers applied the same cultural management, and we also monitored the yield of all both paddies. All other farmer cooperators implement P1, which is the treated paddies. For data processing, we computed the amount of NPK from chemical fertilizers and from rice straw using information from the literature. We have also the copper concentration in the rice field. And we categorize the water stress during the four seasons into six. Zero, no water limitation. Five would be most severe. Meaning to say, water is limiting all throughout the cropping season. The soil in Mugpog from literature is clay loom, and we use this information for computation of fertilizer recommendation. For statistical analysis, we correlated the nutrient inputs, soil copper concentration, water stress level, and the impacts of these parameters on yield. So, some of our results. Now, this picture was taken one month after transplant. And this was taken in rice paddies where there is normal soil cover. Notice that here in the control paddies, the rice crops are exhibiting yellow green leaves, whereas here in the treated paddies, the rice crop have greener leaves. Now, statistical analysis showed that 
the amount of NPK from chemical fertilizers applied in both the treated and controlled paddies are not significantly different. Therefore, we can conclude that the greener leaves here in the treated paddies would get nitrogen contribution from rice straw. And we can use this as proof that the decomposition straw was complete. Now, this is very significant because farmers do not use the rice straw because rice straw decomposes slowly and there will be competition between soil or decay microorganisms and the rice crop during uh, cropping and the leaves would show yellowing. But in this case, you will see that the treated bodies did not exhibit any yellowing. Now, this observation is carried through, um, through the grain filling stage. Notice that the rice plug leaf of the treated bodies would be much greener that compared to the plug leaf of the controlled bodies. And we have quantitative data to show this observation. Here in an upper, uh, normal soil paddies and then you contaminated, the leaf color chart reading is higher than three, whereas the farmer's paddies or the control will be below three. I have already mentioned that the farmers have financial constraints in supplying the required amount of fertilizer. Now here, LCC reading of three to four means nitrogen content of leaf is sufficient, Therefore, chlorophyll content is enough for photosynthesis. Now, the rice farm, uh, the control paddies would be below three. It means the crops are deficient in nitrogen. Now, for our results, now, yield increase of treated paddies, those in blue graphs, would be highly significant compared to the control paddies. In group one, where the copper is normal, copper level is normal, the mean yield increase of T1 versus T sub zero is 76%. In contaminated bodies, the yield increase of T1 versus T2 is 67%. And yield increase in severely contaminated bodies would be 150%. Now, at all cropping seasons with various stress level, you'll notice that treated bodies would have significantly higher yield. But I would like to point out this dry season 2019, when water stress is very severe at five. Notice that the treated or the control paddy has zero yield, whereas here in the treated paddy with normal copper level, the yield is about two tons per hectare. Here in contaminated, again, the control has zero harvest. Here, the treated would be about one time. And here in severely degraded soil, we have 0.5 hectare, ton per hectare in treated and zero for the uh, controlled paddies. Now, the other stresses, water stress and copper concentration would be negatively correlated with yield. The effect of water stress is very significant. For every unit increase in water stress, the yield decrease is 0 0.064 kilograms per square meter. But this yield decrease only explains 42% of the variation in yield. It may be due to other complicating factors such as copper concentration in the soil and nutrient inputs. Now, a statistical analysis also show that potassium is highly correlated with yield, nitrogen, and phosphorus, and that potassium contributed most to yield. Now, I have already mentioned that farmers apply very minimal of the potassium fertilizer. And so the potassium that increased yield must have come from the incorporated rice straw. Now, we have the bar graph of the nutrient inputs and PK from rice straw. Notice these red bar graphs. They stand for potassium input. And if you will recall the previous bar graph on yield, you'll notice that the yield increases would be highly correlated with the increases in potassium. So our findings show that the rice straw computed, uh, contributed significantly to soil nutrients such as potassium and nitrogen that significantly increased yield. In addition, rice straw compost increases soil organic matter. 
and increased soil organic matter improves water holding capacity. And this is very significant. And we have shown this in our results during dry season or during El Nino years. Increased organic matter also promotes higher cation exchange capacity that contributes to better nutrient absorption. Organic matter also increases soil pH, which makes the heavy metal like copper less available. Organic matter also chelates heavy metals, rendering them less toxic. Thus, and farmers find scattering of rice straw after harvest less laborious. Now, the rapid decomposition of rice straw was aided by the trichoderma activator, which was mixed with NPK and they serve as basal, basal fertilizer. MI contributed to rice cropping by growth promotion protection against crop pathogen, and efficient nutrient absorption. Therefore, our results show that the technique of incorporating rice straw during land preparation, the use of activator and NPK fertilizer, plus the seed coating of ally with PMI, can help mitigate the negative impacts of erratic rainfall pattern associated with climate change. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present our results. Thank you very much, Dr. Cuevas. We now move to, to the bees, which are very important also in agriculture. Our <clears throat> next speaker is Dr. Cleofas Cervantia. Dr. Cervantia is a professor emeritus based at the Institute of Biological Sciences. She studied at UPLB and pursued postdoctoral fellowship training in apiculture and pollination biology at the University of Wales, Cardiff. She is a multi-awarded scientist and the most notable are the Lincoln Bayan Presidential Award and the Mount Everest Pollination Award. At present, she is still actively engaged in bee research, mentoring young researchers and students. Her most significant contribution to the nation is the development of pollination technologies using stingless bees and bee product standardization. She connects the Philippines and the rest of the Asian region to the world beekeeping community as president of Asia Commission of Apimondia, an international federation of beekeepers association. Dr. Servancia. And we start video. Start video. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, yeah, a pleasant day to uh, everybody. Uh, my talk for today is part of our pollination biology research at the Institute of Biological Sciences. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, I'll be discussing about uh, uh, the birds and the bees and the flowers and the trees. All right. Now, in agriculture, we use farm inputs, like, for example, entomologists use uh, insecticides to... Uh, to mitigate pests, plant pathologists would use fungicides for diseases, agronomists 
uh, we would look into fertilizers. And of course, the plant breeders will choose the best variety of crops. Now, the aim of which is to provide conditions for plant growth and high yield. But granting that all enabling conditions are present, these alone are not enough to cause fruit setting. That's why pollinators play a key role, especially in plants requiring outcrossing. So pollinator is equal to food because at least one third of the world's agricultural crops depend upon pollination provided by insects and other animals. Now pollinators regulate ecosystem services 87.5% of flowering wild plants depend on animal pollination, 94% in the tropics, 78% in temperate, and three-fourths of food products or crops benefit from animal pollination. And what are these animals? Now the bird is one of them. Now flowers pollinated by birds are colorful with long corolla tubular structure, provide ample nectar and the urinal anthesis. Now the, uh, the uh, bees came into evolution when larger flowers emerge. So there is really a match between the pollinators and the flowers. Now the butterflies as well pollinate brightly colored flowers, open at daytime, provides nectar, long corolla tube, and only the proboscis of this butterfly can access that most sought nectar. You cannot produce durian without the bats. Now, because uh, durian is strictly pollinated by bats, but of course, if you do hand pollination, you can have some fruits. Now, take note that the anthesis or the flower of the uh, durian opens at night and it is harmonized with the behavior of the bats. So nocturnal anthesis, and the uh, nocturnal uh, pollinator as well. Now the beetles pollinate this uh, commercial or industrial plant is the, uh, this is the Af African oil palm that opens also at uh, daytime. Leathery tough petals because as you know, the beetles, they have strong mandibles. Scented, the flower yeah, may be white, pale green or burgundy. Okay. Let me tell you about the bees. Now, uh, the bees pollinate bright colored flower with landing board scented, opens at daytime, and would offer nectar and pollen. Now, what's so fascinating about the bee is floral fidelity. So, honesty, fidelity still holds water. Now, because they are loyal to one species of flower in one foraging tree. Now, if they are not loyal, now the, the flower of cucumber, uh, the pollen of cucumber will not work with squash or uh, the ampalaya. Now Asia is haven for bee. Now this is the uh, seat for pollinator diversity, but this is also the hot spot for biodiversity. So the more we need to conserve our pollinator species, such as the solitary bees. Now if uh, in the global arena, a pollination arena, uh, you have heard the so-called colony collapse disorder. Actually, these are the, pol the population of solitary bees are the ones threatened. And we have our social bees, namely the bumblebee. They pollinate tomato, uh, eggplant, and pepper. We have just concluded one uh, PhD study, a uh, dissertation on the pollination of Selenazi. And then we have the honeybee. Now, if you are very fond of bees and you are afraid of sting, why not go for stingless bee, which is the bee of the future for New Asia. Now, one of the contributions of the Philippines, specifically UP Los Baños, we, the Department of Agriculture, Bureau of Agricultural Research, is the development of uh, technologies for pollination using stingless bees in large scale model. Now this has been adopted in the Philippines and now being shared to neighboring Asian countries. Now let me uh, discuss to you uh, pollination by which I can infuse uh, the concept of management. 
uh, uh, mango is one of the crops laden with pesticides, uh, starting with flower induction. Now, what we did, we studied flora biology, specifically orthesis and longevity. Now, it is very important. Botany is very important. You, you need to know when the flowers open or the blooming period. And then the foraging rates refer to the visitation patterns of our visitors such as pollinators, uh, time of the day they are there, how many flowers they visit, or indeed, are they really pollinating? And of course, we need to quantify the effects of pollinators on fruit set. Now, our results indicated that natural pollinators are scarce in large plantation because as you see, monoculture is practiced. Stingless bee, tetragonula, is the primary pollinator of mango. We compared it with the honeybee species. Now we observed, though, some fly species, which we considered as secondary. And the introduction of colonies of stingless bees increased uh, fruit setting by 42 to 98%. May I invite your attention to this very important graph? We monitor the floral vegetation relative to time. So as you see, from uh, 6 o'clock to uh, 12, uh, we do this depending on the species of crop. Now take note that during early morning hours, there are not too many visitors and the number will, will progress. It will increase as time progresses, reaching at a peak at around 8 o'clock. And then you have there higher, I mean, significantly higher at 7 to until 10 o'clock, and the population diminishes uh, during late, hour, late morning hours and after 12 noon, there are no more pollinators. So what does this tell us? Now, we, um, we found out that the number of, uh, the amount of nectar is highest during the peak of anthesis. The pollen are more, are more a viable, most viable, and the stigma are most receptive. So we call this the pollination window. Again, we strongly recommend for pollinator conservation, should you decide to use any chemical, take note, be it non-synthetic or organic, never do it during the speak of anthesis because the pollinators are most abundant and you will be killing them. So do it at other times of the day. And this should hold true to other crops. No floral biology, no the antithesis. And then develop bee pasture. Now, because you know, we all know that crops do not bloom throughout the year. So we would like to keep the pollinators in our farm. Now plant diverse bee forage. Now this is also a product of our research. We'll ab we are able to identify the best bee plants, so you can beautify the farm and moreover, it can uh, diversify the farm. So in the context of IPM, uh, we, we, uh, we say that diverse ecosystem will, uh, will be, be better in mitigating pest control. So in a nutshell, the conservation strategy would involve using of agricultural inputs wisely do not apply pesticides or at anthesis during early morning hours, but for durian that opens at night and also some crops like dragon fruit, now it's a different story. Uh, let us not overhand wild colonies, especially the stingless bees, and lastly, develop the bee pasture. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Quev, oh, <laughs> Dr. Servantia, because I saw that. <laughs> okay, now we move to our last speaker, not, uh, definitely not the least, because he's a well sought speaker for the past weeks, months regarding COVID. So our last speaker is Dr. Jomar Fajardo Rabahante. He is a professor and UP scientist at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences and Physics, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. He holds an appo appointment as junior associate at the Quantitative Life Sciences Group, 
the Abdul Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. He is also the chair of the Diploma in Mathematics teaching program at the Faculty of Education of UP Open University. Dr. Abahante is one of the ASEAN science diplomats and, as I have mentioned earlier, a well sought resources speaker on the trends of COVID-19. Dr. Rabahante. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Ma'am Nina. Uh, good morning to those uh, who are uh, in this uh, parallel session of PASE. Thank you very much for inviting me here. Okay, so my talk is about um, one of our works actually with uh, Dr. Cervantia and probably this, this is somehow a continuation of uh, what uh, Dr. Cervantia uh, um, told us uh, this uh, morning. Okay, so my talk is about pollinator diversity and density measures and uh, some survey and indexing standards that uh, we are uh, proposing to detect and assess uh, pollinator deficits. And this is uh, in collaboration with the UPLB Biomathematics Initiative and uh, the UPLB B program. Actually, before I, I went to mathematical epidemiology, uh, I'm already uh, one of the uh, drones or probably uh, one of the bees of uh, our queen bee, Dr. Servadja. Okay, um, most of the results that I'm going to uh, show you to, uh, this morning are presented uh, in our paper published uh, just this year, modeling in modeling earth systems and environment, especially the, the mathematical background of uh, our methods. To give you a, an overview why we, we, we did this kind of research, because uh, there are several things that we need to address, especially in pollination biologies, specifically in Asia. And uh, in 2016, in uh, Science Magazine, um, there are several scientists recommending uh, 10 policies for uh, pollinators. And the, the ninth uh, bullet there is saying that we need to develop long-term monitoring of pollinators, and not just the pollinators, but also the pollination itself. Um, despite the importance of uh, pollinators to agriculture and to the economy, sadly, the data regarding uh, pollinators and pollination in the Philippines and the whole Asian region, region has been limited. And uh, one of the reasons is that we don't have a standardized or harmonized method in serving the diversity and abundance of pollinator species including native bee species, such as the stingless bees. And um, the use of widely varying serving me survey methods could lead to difficulty in comparing the temporal and spatial status of pollination in Asian countries. So one example is, can we answer this question? Is there a decline of pollinators in Asia? And to answer this question is very difficult because we cannot compare um, the results uh, coming from different methods. Specifically, uh, the methods are assuming different assumptions and, some, and mo often it's very difficult to, to compare um, the numbers. And uh, FAO established the International Pollination Initiative. Um, unfor unfortunately, the, the only regions uh, included here it, are uh, from Europe, North America, Latin America, Africa, and Oceania only. And um, we are envisioning uh, in, uh, in partnership with the uh, uh, Association of, uh, of uh, Bee uh, pr uh, Practitioners in, in Asia, we are envisioning that uh, to have a research initiative as a similar initiative for the ASEAN region. And this could help in narrowing the knowledge gap on global pollination. 
And uh, if we are going to focus on the methods used, there is actually no universal pollinator diversity and density, density measure that can compreh comprehensively describe all pollinator ecosystems. And uh, we, with our uh, study, we actually uh, uh, surveyed and the, uh, we have seen that common indices uh, available in the literature do not consider species interaction, such as plant pollinator interaction. And uh, with that, we derived a new index that is compatible to our uh, proposed survey method to monitor changes in pollinator deficits that I'm going to uh, somehow uh, show you later briefly, which uh, considers plant pollinator interaction. We call this new index as the P2P index. Okay, just to give you a brief overview of the survey method, and then later on, I'm going to show you the, the P2P index. The first step, we have actually three steps here in our uh, proposed uh, uh, survey method. The first step is planning. And uh, with, with the planning, um, we can start first by hearing the, the opinions of experts or practitioners in a certain uh, pollinator hotspot. It's, it's very important to have this uh, 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 first part of the planning for us to, to have a clear picture of what really happened historically and uh, during the present uh, situation in the uh, locality. And uh, in our uh, survey method, we have actually considered two types of location. The first one is for the orchard or agroecosystem, and the second one is for natural vegetation. And uh, with the uh, ranking of pollinator hotspots, um, we, we also need to consider the seasonality of uh, flowers and the area. And if, if, let's say, the expert would consider a certain place as uh, class A, class B, or class C, it depends on the likelihood of having high number of flowers and pollinators. Um, the, the, the survey expert, uh, of expert opinion is just a starting point. But uh, the next steps will be more statistical in the sense that uh, we need to, to consider two-stage sampling and mapping of each hotspot. If, if you have some experts uh, working with GIS, that will be good. And uh, the first stage will be randomly selecting hotspots. And um, in our calculator and our um, template calculator, we have already uh, uh, included this uh, sampling uh, calculator. And then the second stage is after selecting the hotspots, in one, in one locality, we need to randomly select 100 square meter sites to be surveyed. And this is uh, for orchard and agroecosystem. We can have this or uh, we can have this um, setting. So these are some of the examples that we have surveyed um, with our team in, uh, from the UPLDB program. And for natural vegetation, the, the method will be quite different in the sense that we need to find possible nesting sites of pollinators. And then after finding the, uh, the different pollinator net nesting sites, we randomly select nest nesting sites based on the calculator that uh, we have included in the template that I'm going to show you later. Okay, and then after that, during also the planning stage, we conduct initial observation of the sample sites to answer um, questions such as how many flowers a pollinator, pollinator species can visit in a day. Um, this is uh, just to get the visitation rate. Uh, what is the possibility of a species to be a pollinator of a plant species? So we need to consider the plant pollinator matching. And uh, this initial uh, observation will be used in the preparation or training of the persons who will do this survey. And then the step two is the actual survey. For the actual survey for orchards and agroecosystem, um, we have two options. So the first one is uh, as shown in this uh, slide. We, we count the number of flowers and their visiting pollinators. We record the numbers per species of flowers and species of pollinator. And we can also have this uh, set up. Um, the idea here is uh, definitely the setups will be different, but the idea is we need to have an equivalent um, protocol equivalent to at least 300 sweeps per 100 square meter site uh, using a sweep net. 
for natural vegetation, the nesting site uh, of the pollinator will be the center. And of course, the survey period should be during the antithesis as uh, uh, discussed by Dr. Servantia. And uh, if there are other nests within the 250 meter radius, the counts will be corrected uh, mathematically. We can also use a mathematical extrapolation for distances greater than 250 meters. So these are some of the pictures that uh, we took during uh, one, or one of our survey uh, uh, observations in, in Calamba, Laguna. Okay, these are some of the pictures. And uh, the step three is more on the assessment and uh, the computation of the indices. And uh, we, have, we created a Microsoft Excel template. Um, we use Microsoft Excel so that uh, this is very common to uh, software to, to most of us. So we use this so that uh, many of the researchers can use our calculator. Um, fr from the template, we have there the sample size calculator and also we have there included the, the different diversity measures. We have modified Shannon index for pollinators and modified Shannon index for flowers. But uh, the original derivation that we have included in the template is our uh, uh, P2P uh, ratio and index. The P2P ratio and index is uh, to, to measure the pollination matching. And um, the threshold there is uh, one. If we have less than uh, one, means few pollinators, uh, there are few pollinators compared to the plants or the, uh, compared to the flowers. And the idea of the P2P ratio and index is based on pollination networks. This is because um, uh, with the idea, this is uh, coming from the idea that um, there are certain species of pollinators that are uh, best suitable for certain uh, plants, specific, uh, probably because of their body size and uh, because of their foraging behavior. Uh, the first, the first uh, computation is the P2P ratio for a pollinator species in a specific survey per, uh, period. And the, the, this uh, um, value is a function of the abundance of the pollinator species, okay? the visitation rate of the pollinator species and the flower assignment value, where the flower assignment value is as shown in the screen is the summation of the possibility value of being a pollinator of plant species I and number of flowers of plant species I. So there is in the template you need to, to input values in a certain matrix and uh, the normalization factor. Okay, and then after computing for a certain survey period, uh, for a specific pollinator species, we can compute the P2P index for as an aggregate of the different uh, pollinator species in a, a specific survey period. And the formula is shown here also in the slide. Um, take note that uh, there are two values here. The P2P ratio is computed for each pollinator species while P2P index is the aggregate measure for all pollinators. And uh, from the, uh, in the uh, uh, Microsoft uh, template, we have also included there the increase, decrease measure, uh, like the geometric mean with respect to a reference survey period to, to, measure, uh, to measure change in time. Let's say we've started doing the, the survey five years ago. So we need to use our method uh, from that time up to the future so that uh, we will have a harmonized method uh, through the years and we can compare the temporal uh, changes in the pollinator uh, dynamics. And there's also the summary of indices, whether local or national. So just to show you um, what are the values that can be inputted in the Excel file. So you have here the pollinator abundance and the plant abundance. And um, of course, uh, these are, uh, I'm showing you the the template, but um, in the template, we have also included there the, the somehow uh, researcher non-mathematical uh, friendly uh, results. But uh, this is uh, just to show you what's inside the template. And um, this template already automatically calculates everything for you after inputting the, the values that uh, 
needed to be input that uh, that the needed input. Okay, just to briefly show you some of the examples, we uh, surveyed one site in Kalamba for an apalaya farm, and as you can see from the screen, the apalaya fruit is not that good in terms of the aesthetic, and one of the reasons is uh, there's a lack of uh, pollination. And this is uh, one of the reasons is when we went to that survey uh, site, we only saw two roaming carpenter bees and approximately 20 uh, cabbage butterflies and flies, but there are 48,000 flowers in 400 rows. This is a two hectare uh, Ampalaya uh, farm. And uh, when we computed the modified Shannon index, it's less than one means of course, there's a low diversity of pollinator and the uh, carpenter bee visitation is 15 minutes interval per row, which means the carpenter bee might be uh, too stressed uh, working with, with the work of a, as a pollinator. And the P2P ratio is uh, less than one, actually near zero, which means that there are few pollinators compared to the inflorescence. And uh, as I uh, said, there are 48,000 flowers and approximately 28,000 fruits. And uh, we asked the, the, the owner of the farm uh, about the timing of the pesticide application. She said they apply pesticide during the morning. And there's another site, a cucumber farm, and also not too far from that Ampalaya farm. But uh, what we have found is a, a totally different story. There are approximately 600 uh, Apis serrana bees and other uh, pollinators. There are 48,000 flowers in 30 rows. The, the, this farm is smaller than the previous farm, but uh, the story is totally different. There are many bees around. When we, we computed the P2P ratio, uh, the value is 1.5, greater than one. Not high, but still greater than one, which means that there are enough number of pollinators for available inflorescence. And the, uh, they have many fruits. And we ask, what's the reason? I mean, we just asked that the, the farmer, um, what time they uh, apply pesticides, they said they still apply pesticide, but in the afternoon. So because of that very uh, um, slight difference in the, in the behavior of the farmer, the, the resulting uh, diversity and uh, abundance of pollinator uh, are very different. And we have also other activities, uh, mango farm in Pangasinan. Uh, and one of possible reasons for, for the difference in the stories of, uh, of the two farms in Kalamba is uh, because of the schedule and location of pesticide application. And Dr. Servancia has already uh, highlighted this uh, dur during her uh, presentation this morning. And just to give you a brief background, we also did study on the foraging behavior of pollinators using um, mathematical methods. And uh, we also, we just don't use uh, mathematical methods. We also ask our applied math students to also do some of the actual um, uh, observation using this type of uh, experimental design. So, they so that uh, they will have some idea about how to implement the uh, simulations and models. And uh, these are just some examples. And uh, we did this type of experimental, experimental designs. And yes, um, uh, from the result, there are specific foraging behavior that uh, we can somehow uh, see patterns. And probably we can use this for further um, optimi optimization of uh, the use of these for uh, crop pollination. Okay, and uh, we want to acknowledge our sponsors, the ABAR, UPLB, and Crap Life Asia, and of course, the UPL Biomath and the UPL DB program. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rabahante. So that is our last speaker. I now give the floor to my co-host, Dr. Palier, for the Q&A portion. Dr. Palier. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nina. Um, we have a question for uh, yours truly. Um, Dr. Palier from uh, 
we have we know that we still lack a lot of data by the way the question is from dr sumalde the, uh, we lack data regarding virus that causes COVID-19. Nonetheless, may we know your opinion if the virus would be able to contaminate crops through feces of COVID-19 patients? Um, well, uh, reports mentioned that the virus has been found in the feces of some patients diagnosed with COVID-19. However, it is unclear whether the virus found in feces may be capable of causing uh, COVID-19. There has been, uh, there has not been any confirmed report of the virus spreading from feces to a person. But um, researchers do not know how much risk there is that the virus could be spread from the feces of an infected person to another person. However, they think that the risk is low based on data from previous outbreaks of diseases caused by SARS and uh, MERS. -CoV. But for parasites, not, uh, virus has a different uh, biology and dynamics, but for parasites, they can remain viable for three to five years in the soil and other environmental samples. But for virus, uh, uh, they are the the viability is a uh, few days or, or a few hours thank you and then question for um for myra from dr raimundo uh -huh. Uh, from Dr. Raimundo, congrats, uh, Myra, on your presentation. It's a big jump from Resitonia to melanocytes. Uh, do those herbs you discuss being used in suntans or whitening lotions? What is the mechanism of action? Um, thank you, Mamekar, for the question. Uh, most of the um, formulations that uh, you can find in drugstores or in the supermarket would, uh, if they're whitening compound, they would inhibit tyrosinase activity or tyrosinase uh, expression. So tyrosinase is the, the key enzyme for producing melanin. So that's why if it has a, for example, I think um, most of the, of the whitening compounds in, in the Philippines are made up of this uh, arbutin or their derivatives. But in other countries, it's already banned. And um, for our uh, work on this, um, there is a venture company based in Italy who wanted to develop um, lotion that can be used to promote uh, pigmentation because tanning is very big in, in Europe. Whereas for us, you want to have lighter skin color. In Europe, they want to have darker skin color. And one of our work uh, that I have works, uh, research uh, uh, topics that I presented is this work on tyratanin. And in fact, a Japanese company known as uh, uh, called Nano Innovation Lab has uh, this line of products. And their product is called Suna Shot. And they also have shampoo that promote uh, hair color naturally. It's not a temporary hair color that uh, you can add or you apply on your hair and it will fade away. It actually promotes natural hair pigmentation. So if we published a uh, work on uh, the effect on, melanog on melanogenesis of teratanin, but if you want to buy this product, it's, uh, uh, it's called Suna Shot. And I'm not sure if you can buy it in the Philippines, but I'm sure they can they can make it happen. So yeah, that's it, I think. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Myra. A uh, question for Dr. Cuevas from uh, Paolo Arena. The TMI you used in Marinduque is the same TMI we are using with uh, three strains of trichoderma. For those who want to be composting in their backyard, can we also recommend TMI to be used? If yes, what will be the rate to be used? Uh, thank you uh, for the question. Um, it, this TMI can be used, but it's too expensive because it costs more. Remember, it is um, made up of three different uh, strains and two species of trichoderma. 
the uh, activator is cheaper, much cheaper. If you are going to use it for your back uh, backyard composting, uh, we recommend that you use the activator because it's cheaper. The, the TMI is really on, uh, much more effective for enhancing uh, crop production, increasing yield for efficient uh, nutrient absorption and improving root architecture. <clears throat> okay, so thank you, ma'am. Uh, for Dr. Servancia, uh, is it possible for bees to develop resistance against pesticides? Um, unfortunately, it hasn't happened yet. So many studies, so all pesticides really harm bees. So I hope one day they will, but nevertheless, it also poses hazard because they will contaminate the bee products which are used for human consumption. Okay, um, thank you, ma'am. A uh, question for uh, Dr. Rabahante from Dr. Sumalde from UPLB. How many times did you monitor for the presence of pollinators which you used in the study? Would it be better to have a composite data from several monitorings of the same study site? Yes, um, I agree. Uh, we need to consider more than one uh, visit uh, with the site. Actually, our standard is to, to have three three visits, at least three visits, but uh, more will be better. But uh, three uh, is, uh, is enough uh, based on uh, some standards with FAO. Okay. Uh, another interesting question from uh, Dr. Ronilo Flores for Dr. Rabahante. Thank you very much for your presentation. What is the feasibility of the use of a mathematical model in predicting or tracking microbial or parasitic sources and destination in an ecosystem and the consequences that it poses. I would like to juxtapose the question in the light of Dr. Palier's presentation. I am particularly interested in the possibility of developing an integrated scale or risk guide for the creation of smarter decisions and policies. Um, yeah, I, I, we, we can use mathematical model in many areas in biology, in microbiology or in parasitology. Actually, uh, I'm working with uh, Dr. Palier in one of her studies with schistosomiasis in Mindanao. Yeah, okay. So thank you. Um, we have a question for uh, Dr. Cuevas. If there are other sources of potassium which can be readily accessed in order to mitigate the tailings affected cropping areas? Uh, the easiest source would be the chemical fertilizer. There you have uh, potassium chloride. But returning the rice straw to the field is the cheapest. And rice requires large amounts of potassium. The requirement is, uh, I think, is even uh, close or higher, a little higher than the requirement for, or close to the requirement for nitrogen. And potassium, uh, the rice straw is a good source. So, uh, potassium chloride, chemical fertilizer, is the easiest source, but it's expensive. Okay. Um, a question also for um, Myra. Of Myra, does the increase in melanin content of PCQA in vivo experiments give a sense of validation to the cultural belief that coffee leads to a darker color? Say, pinaglihi sa kape. Is there an indication that PCQA can be used topically as an alternative tanning and sunbathing? The, the photo that I, I showed uh, during my presentation, um, in that photo, the TCKA was applied topically. So we did not uh, uh, give TCKA as an oral. Uh, orally, it was not orally administered. So like what we do with, with coffee. So we do not have any study wherein um, TCKA was fed, but we have published work on um, orally administered TCKA and its effect on not, not TCQA, uh, pure TCQA, but rather purple sweet potato that's rich in TCQA. 
and it has an effect on memory and learning, but we did not check the effect on pigmentation, skin pigmentation. So what I can say is that, uh, and uh, actually TCQA is not, uh, uh, is also present in coffee, but uh, there will be higher concentration in what is referred to as green coffee. So I can't really, I cannot say if the saying pinaglisa kape is true. So maybe we can, we need further research uh, to, to validate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have several interesting questions here, but uh, some uh, of our panelists have already answered them through uh, typing. Uh, for questions uh, which were not entertained, uh, you can email to us and we will throw them to our respective panelists. In the interest of time, uh, uh, we can no longer entertain uh, those interesting questions. We shall now uh, proceed to the synthesis. Dr. Cadiz may. Yes, thank you. There are lots of interesting questions. But perhaps they can also type, the panelists, the answer to the questions. So to give the synthesis of our parallel session is Dr. Romel Sulabo. Dr. Sulabo is a professor of monogastric nutrition and the director of the Institute of Animal Sciences, University of the Philippines, Los Baños. He received his MS and PhD in animal science at South Dakota State University and Kansas State University respectively. He obtained further trainings in animal science as a postdoctoral research fellow at Kansas State University and University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Solabo? Thank you very much, Dr. Cadiz, uh, and a pleasant morning or day to all of the participants. So I have the enviable job of uh, synthesizing seven excellent talks uh, this morning, and I hope I can give justice to these presentations. Uh, unfortunately, I only have five minutes to the synthesis. So we first had two excellent uh, guest lecturers. The first was from uh, Dr. Jan Leach of Colorado State University, and she talked about the impacts of climate change on, uh, on plant disease and the challenges for agriculture. And she started with talking about uh, the impacts of extreme weather events on agriculture. And as uh, she stated, uh, the picture for agriculture is very bleak as yields will be severely affected. And at the same time, uh, there is also evidence of increased greenhouse gases as demonstrated in rice. The challenge for us in managing this uh, uh, challenges is that most of the historical data would uh, focus on investigating plant responses to single uh, stressors. But what we need to, I think, understand is that phytobiomes are a complex system. That we need to look at it at, as a systems approach rather than individual factors and embrace the complexity. Thankfully, today we have advances that sets the stage. He listed three major advances that's helping us uh, solve these issues. The first would be, would be advances in systems level approaches. Uh, second would be uh, microbiome discoveries and its role in improving plant productivity. And uh, this actually strikes me as uh, something that we, we, which is also very uh, close to us in uh, the animal industry as we understand now the important role of the microbiome. And then finally, uh, management strategies such as precision agriculture. And to demonstrate um, the main point of Dr. Leach, she talked about um, the dilemma that we have uh, in uh, between heat tolerance genes and disease uh, resistant genes in rice. Enhancing heat tolerance may may increase susceptibility of plants to pathogens or vice versa. So I think the main point here is that uh, the phytobiomes are impacted simultaneously by multiple stressors and studying their outcomes may help us more effectively develop successful and sustainable crop production systems. Our second guest lecturer was uh, Dr. Mila uh, Evangelista. 
uh, from the USDA ARS National Center for Agriculture Utilization Research. And uh, she talked about assessing novel protein sources for value added uses and uh, markets, particularly pennycress, amelina, coriander, and feia. And I kind of related to Dr. Evangelista's uh, talk uh, because she worked on evaluating novel uh, plant-based proteins that is also similar to the work that we do here at the Institute of Animal Science, assessing alternative protein sources. And in fact, we've also done some work with Camelina. And what Dr. Evangelista provided us today is actually a model for evaluation, looking at the composition of the materials, uh, looking at the protein functional properties of these protein sources, and see what would be the potential applications. So looking at solubility, foaming pro properties, emulsification properties, water holding capacities, and stability to heat. And I think this is something that we could take a look at as we explore uh, alternative protein sources that we can use also here in the Philippines, not just for uh, the feed industry, but uh, particularly in the food uh, industry. Then we had uh, five presentations in our oral sessions. The first was by Dr. Rachel Gay Palier, uh, and she talked about uh, revisiting farming practices, implications of zoonotic parasites and food safety. And I don't know about you, but I'm kind of got a little bit scared from what Dr. Palier said. And uh, she, she talked about the dynamics of parasite contamination and transmission in agricultural setting through assessment of soil, water, and farm produce. And a lot of the data that she mentioned was quite telling. Uh, some of the things that she shared uh, was the high rate of, uh, higher rate of positive, a uh, uh, higher positive rate of parasites in organic produce versus conventional farm produce. She talked about the impact of um, uh, proce uh, processing, such as, such as composting, in reducing um, uh, parasites in uh, uh, animal manure. Um, she listed a, a few things on possible contamination sources, such as raw or improperly composted manure, contaminated water, presence of animals in the farm, yeah. lack of field sanitation and cross-contamination. And this kind of highlights the importance of a coordinated effort to bring all the resources for us to be able to control foodborne illnesses. The next talk was from Dr. Myra Villarreal, uh, and she talked about natural products that regulate melanogenesis by targeting MITF. And I think what this provides us is the richness of um, of natural products that we can explore. And I think the Philippines is very rich in, in, in these natural products. One of the things that she mentioned uh, that was striking uh, to me was that um, half of the drugs that have been uh, released uh, since 1994 came from natural products. And I think uh, this is something that we need to uh, uh, explore further. And specifically, she talked about natural products from Tirelea hirsuta that has been shown to regulate MITF, uh, tyrosinase, and other melanogenesis-associated enzymes, and its impact on uh, melanogenesis. And uh, she set the tone that there is a need for us to focus more uh, on uh, natural product research. And I think this is something that uh, we in the Philippines can explore further. The next talk was from our Professor Emeritus, Dr. Virginia Cuevas, and she uh, discussed a study that they did in Mogpog Marinduque in 2018 and 2019, looking at the effect of rice straw composting and the use of trichoderma microbial inoculant as an adaptive strategy uh, to uh, address problems related to climate change in lowland rice cropping. And the results proved that the technique of incorporating rice straw during land preparation with the use of TMI activator uh, can increase uh, yield even in carport contaminated bottles, uh, pa uh, paddies, 
uh, as much as 150%. And uh, this can help mitigate the negative impacts of erratic rainfall pattern associated with climate change. The next talk was again from one of our professor emeritus here at UPLB, Dr. Cleofas Cervantia, the Queen Bee. Uh, and she talked about pollinator conservation in agricultural landscape. And this is something that is becoming more and more important for us. And to realize that 75%, in fact, of food crops benefit from animal, uh, from animal uh, pollination. And she discussed uh, a conservation strategy. The first was to use uh, agricultural inputs. Second is uh, using uh, mango blooms as an example, where you do not apply pesticides at antithesis, where pollinators are most abundant. Uh, do not overhunt wild uh, colonies and to develop a bee uh, pasture, which not only beautifies the farm, but also creates diversity in the farm operation. And finally was the presentation of uh, uh, Dr. Jomer F. Rabahante, where they developed a long-term monitoring uh, uh, protocol for pollinators and pollination. And this clearly shows the, the not just the potential, but the clear uh, uh, benefit of uh, using quantitative protocols in, in agriculture production. And the work that they did was to uh, really evaluate if there is a decline of pollinators in Asia that I think we need to understand. And what, the, what they propose is to use the new index, which is the P2P index or ratio, which can help us determine pollinator plant interaction. Um, and so finally, uh, my last comments here is the, the session is about transcending boundaries in agriculture. And I think what, highlight, what is highlighted from the talks that we had today is the importance of managing the complexity in, in agriculture. And this may really rely on improving our understanding of the multiple factors that affect the activity either singly or in combination. And in light of the global pandemic, this has to push us to be more interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary in approach. And we have to maintain our optimism in science. So thank you very much and congratulations to all of our speakers. Thank you so much, Dr. Sulabo. I would like to thank all who attended this parallel session, especially to our guests and session speakers for sharing their knowledge and expertise. I also thank the UPLB Information Technology Center, especially Mr. John Eric Dao, who has been with us since the preparation of this parallel session. I would like to acknowledge the hard work of our PASA president, Dr. Gisela Concepcion, and for giving me the opportunity to host this session. Thank you, Dr. Concepcion. And as what our theme says, agriculture transcending boundaries, I hope that we will be able to forge collaborations in the near future. With this, we now end our session. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. We also invite them for the other parallel sessions of our online Congress, the APAMS 2020. They can just go to the PASE webpage, paase.org for the uh, remaining parallel sessions. And in addition, uh, there will be an evaluation uh, form. The link will be sent to your respective emails um, within the week. Thank you. Thank you to my co-host and to our rapporteur, Dr. Rachel Palier and Dr. Sulabo. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye now. Bye.